How do you treat parathyroid hyperplasia in primary hyperparathyroidism? I'm Dr. Bob Aklarian from Center for Advanced Parathyroid Surgery. Let's go through the steps of parathyroid surgery, but before doing that, let me just explain to you what parathyroid hyperplasia looks like. So someone who doesn't have kidney disease causing hyperparathyroidism, when you have hyperplasia, that means all of the glands are enlarged and all of them have abnormal parathyroid cells, right? Now, we think in our head that all of the glands will be equally enlarged, and that's almost never the case. What you generally have is what we call asymmetric hyperplasia, where you have one or two or three that are bigger, and one or two that are smaller, as in this case. Now, this is an example of it, where you see three enlarged parathyroid and one that is fairly normal site. But un under the microscope, all four of them are abnormal, right? So the treatment for parathyroid hyperplasia is to reduce the number of abnormal parathyroid cells. You can't necessarily cure someone who has hyperplasia. You just reduce the number of abnormal cells to a number that still services that person's needs, right? And hopefully you can buy them enough time that in their lifetime, that last remaining parathyroid that you left behind doesn't get big enough to get, create trouble, okay? so. The steps of surgery are the same as treating an adenoma. First step is to make an incision. The incision is the same size, two centimeters, because the skin in the neck is so pliable that you can move it to reach all four areas where the parathyroids exist. Then once you pull the skin apart, you see the muscle layer underneath, and this is it. Next, at this point in time, I usually get a PTH level. So in this case, it's 105, all right? Next, you retract one of the muscles so you can get to see the thyroid underneath it. And here, as you can see the thyroid and the breathing tube. After that, you retract the thyroid and the breathing tube so that you can get to see the parathyroid and the nerve next to it. And this is the white line is the nerve, and these are the two parathyroids on that side. So once you've seen the two parathyroids on one side, you do the same thing on the opposite side. You look at the other two. And once you've looked at them, you decide which one is the smallest. In this particular case, the right lower one is the smallest parathyroid. So what I do is I biopsy that smallest parathyroid first put a little clip away from the side that has the blood vessels to send that to the pathologist to make sure that that in fact is a parathyroid, not fatty tissue or a lymph node or anything else. Remove the upper parathyroid, go to the opposite side, remove the other two parathyroids. And then at five, 10 and 15 minutes after I've removed all of the three parathyroids, I check the PTH levels. And if it comes down and plateaus in a lower level, then I know that I've removed an adequate amount of parathyroid cells. I've left enough parathyroid cells for them to function adequately for that person to be okay and not need um, parathyroid supplementation, calcium, vitamin D, so on and so forth. And, and then I start closing this, the muscle, bringing it together with one suture, and then two layers of sutures under the surface to bring the skin together without any sutures on the surface and then I put a tape on it and the patient can get up and go home the same day. I always draw what I found during the surgery so that I know that this lower one here was the one that I left behind so that if, if this person 10, 15 years down the line needs another surgery, I know where that parathyroid is, I know where the nerves are in relation to that parathyroid and how to address the, the, this person's disease again. I always put my patients on calcium supplementation with vitamin D. I also give them magnesium, arnica, and bromelain to help with the swelling and bruising. The magnesium, calcium, and vitamin D is to prevent them from having too low a calcium after surgery. All patients who have hyperparathyroidism have loss of calcium from their bone. So when the calcium is elevated in hyperparathyroidism, it's not because they're consuming too much calcium, it's because it's leaking out of their bones. So even if their bones are normal, they have less calcium than they should otherwise. And so this calcium regimen is to prevent them from falling into in the situation where their calcium is too low and they get symptomatic and in trouble.
right? And then in the long term, I really advise my patients to take a lot of calcium containing foods, make sure that they're appropriately supplemented with vitamin D if they need it and go on from there. Uh, generally speaking for hyperplasia, I get a lab at one week after surgery, one month and six months to see how things are going and then annually thereafter. Um, patients generally do well with the surgery, especially because you have PTH testing to support the fact that you've left an adequate amount of parathyroid behind and that they're gonna function properly. Um, uh, because the sutures are all absorbable, you don't really need to see your doctor. Again, after surgery, most of the time I, I give my cell phone to my patients so they call me and they com communicate directly with me. They'll send me pictures of their incision and healing. We can FaceTime and I can kind of monitor their post-operative uh, recovery phase and help guide and navigate them through it. If you like this video and find it helpful, please like it please subscribe to our channel. That way we know what kind of videos are helpful to you and how we can help you with it and what other videos we should make to help you a lot. Stay well.